And I don't know, I know I'm a conspiracy theorist. Good morning, YouTube. Once again, Cruise Man coming to you live from, well, not live, but coming to you from the picturesque, beautiful, garden like Carrollton, Texas. Just gonna go out for a little ride this morning because it's such a beautiful morning. The weather is perfect. No wind, 64 degrees. You couldn't ask for a better day just to get out and ride. There's no clouds, no rain for a change. We've had a ton of rain this year. And I've just got a lot of stuff that I want to talk to you about. And I guess the uh, I guess the theme of this motive log is staying safe. That's all you hear nowadays. I think we're in day number 26, if I'm correct. I may be wrong. I'll, I may be off a few days, a day or two. Day 26 of the uh, shutdown, you might say, of the economy. And I know many of you have a lot of concerns about that. I know I do. And I, for one, am ready to see things start getting back to some form of normal. Now, I know it isn't going to happen overnight, but it needs to start, and it needs to start soon. I'd say within a week, they need to start letting some of these businesses open back up and get back to normal. Now, I know I'm going to get a lot of criticism for that. I know some of you are going to put in comments about how I don't care about people getting sick and dying. and That's not true. We have been in this mitigation process now for probably six to eight weeks, going, getting close to it. And I know it's having an effect. I know it's helping uh, flatten that curve, so to speak. But when you shut down the entire economy, no travel, no airlines, even some states aren't letting people cross state lines. Um, you're, you're running into a really dangerous precedent here. And it concerns me. It concerns me for the future of the country after we do come out of this. The virus will go away. At some point, this virus will run its course. It will kill however many people. They said originally it was going to kill a couple of million people in the U.S. Now they've lowered that estimate down to 60,000. Now, is that because of the mitigation? We don't know. The medical community community and the scientists all say that's why it's only going to be 60,000 because of all this shutdown. Um, but the truth is we really don't know. From the very beginning I've said some of these numbers just don't add up and for all we know because we don't have good testing we don't have broad testing of the general population which you'd really have to have to know what the situation is. Right now they're just guessing. Because the only people that are getting tested are the people with symptoms that go to the hospital or that go to their doctor and then they get a test and then that becomes part of the number. But the number that always stood out to me because I have, as you know, I have a connection to the cruise industry. And it always concerned me when they said that 40 people on Grand Princess had COVID-19. And they talk about how this is a highly communicable disease. You can't even stand within six feet of people. Now they're saying to wear the masks when you're out in public. Don't get within six feet. Don't shake hands. Don't touch your face. All these things. Now I'm telling you 
that it's not possible on a ship with 4,500 people for only 40 people to have had this virus. Now, I can't prove that scientifically, but I'm telling you there's almost no time on a cruise ship when you're not within six feet of other people. And this was like a two-week cruise. And it was a similar story for Diamond Princess and some of these other ships. So just using my own deductive logic, I'm going to suggest that 3,000 people were infected on that ship, or at least 2,000, at least 50% of that ship was infected with COVID-19. And they didn't test them. They only tested the people with symptoms because back then they didn't have enough tests. And we don't even know how reliable the tests were. So I'm going to suggest to you that probably 2,000 to 3,000 of the 4,500 were infected and either never showed symptoms or they had very mild symptoms. Maybe they thought it was a head cold or you know, they had a stiff neck one morning or maybe they got a headache or whatever and it went away and their body fought it off fine. Especially the younger, healthier people. If that's true, that means that it's possible that 50 to 60 percent of the general population of this country has already been infected with this virus and doesn't even know it. You say, well, there's no proof of that. There's no proof otherwise either because they haven't done the testing. Right now, you still only get tested if you're showing symptoms. So, my point being is, if that were the case, and a large percentage of our population was infected or had been infected and fought it off, there's no reason to have all this stuff shut down. You can't infect somebody that's already infected. Or you can't infect somebody that's already had built up the antibodies uh, to fight off the infection because they've already had it and fought it off. Now, I know this goes against so-called science. But the more of this I watch on TV, and unfortunately I've been forced to watch quite a bit of it because there's not much else to do. I'm becoming less and less enamored with the scientific community. I never was really enamored with them anyway, to be honest with you. I've always kind of questioned these so-called science behind a lot of things. But it bothers me when I see the head of the CDC and the National In Institute of Infectious Disease, I think it is, Dr. Fauci, kind of blow off hydroxychloroquine as an unproven drug. And then an hour later, I'll watch another show where you have these uh, epidemiologists in France, the leading epidemiologist in France, maybe one in the world, who's treated over a thousand patients with hydroxychloroquine, and it's been 91% effective. And none of those 1,070, I believe it was, or 1,060, none of them showed any harsh side effects. So why is our CDC and our leading authority on infectious disease dismissing this drug as a possible prophylactic or a treatment? In a lot of these African countries, they take hydroxychloroquine on a regular basis to prevent malaria. And there's been very little outbreak of COVID-19 in those countries. So my question is, if that drug, which is very cheap, it's in generic form, if that drug is an effective prophylactic, why do we need the big rush for a vaccine? And this brings up the idea that money and medicine and pharmaceuticals. I am getting more and more convinced that our bureaucracies like the FDA and the CDC 
there's some unholy alliance there with Big Pharma. Big Pharma doesn't make any money on hydroxychloroquine because it's a generic. I think it's 10 bucks a month for a prescription. Dirt cheap. And I don't know. I know I'm a conspiracy theorist. But so what? You can disagree with me. That's okay. I can't prove any of this. I'm just saying it looks a little suspicious when the media, a large amount of the media, and an, a, a certain amount of the medical community are coming out against a drug that has been effective in so many different cases. So anyway, that's my rant on, you know, this whole idea of staying safe and mitigation. I have a secret that I haven't told any of you before. I know how to completely prevent the risk of getting injured on a motorcycle. I can eliminate the risk tomorrow. I can tell you how to eliminate the risk. This is a little known secret, by the way, where you'd never have to worry about getting hit from behind or having a car pull out in front of you. If you want to stay safe and never get injured on a motorcycle, just don't ride a motorcycle. Stop riding. And you'll never have to worry about protective gear. You'll never have to worry about wearing a helmet. You'll never have to worry about getting injured. But for most of us, that wouldn't be an option because we love riding. So we're willing to take the risk. And at some point, you're going to decide you love the way our life was before this whole thing started. And there are risks involved in life. And you can do things to mitigate those risks, but that doesn't mean you shut down everything and stop living. It doesn't mean you have to stop going to restaurants. It doesn't mean you have to stop everything. We've got to get back to work. These small businesses are not going to survive if this economy stays shut down another two or three weeks. They're not going to come back. And you may end up living in a country where there are very few restaurants, very few theaters or no theaters, very few entertainment venues or no entertainment venues. You think it can't happen, but it has happened to other countries before. It could take 20 years for this country to get back to where it was, and it probably will never get back to where it was if we wait much longer. Yes, people are going to die. There is a risk of that, but there's things we can do to mitigate that risk and still go back to work. We can still wash our hands more frequently. We can still wear masks. We can still keep a reasonable distance between us and the people we work with in a factory or in an office. There's a lot of things we can still do to minimize those risks, but those risks aren't going away. Unfortunately, we have a political environment where our president knows very well that if he orders the country back to work, every death from that day forward will be hung around his neck and will be his fault. And he could possibly face legal uh, crimes against humanity. They're already talking about it. I'm not making this up. They're already talking about it. Sadly, that's the situation we're in. Because I think his instinct is for everybody to get back to work. Because he knows what can happen if we don't. So that's my rant for the day on our current shutdown. Make a little U-turn here. Ah, uh, yeah, not have the sun in my face. That's much better. You know, you're welcome to disagree with me in the comments down below. I welcome all opinions. I have a good friend that 
doesn't agree with me on these subjects. And uh, we're still able to be friends. No big deal. You don't have to agree with me. I want all of you to stay safe. But I also want you to be able to get back to work. And I want you to be able to reopen your business. And I want our country to begin to heal from this. And again, are you willing to give up riding a motorcycle to eliminate the risk of riding a motorcycle? Because that's what we're doing with our whole economy right now. So I invite your uh, comments. Try to keep them uh, somewhat respectable. I want to thank you again for joining me, taking time out of your day to watch my videos. And while you're stuck at home with nothing to do, this is a great time to binge watch Cruise Man's Garage videos. Go back through and watch all my motor vlogs or all my other videos. I think people are doing that because I'm seeing videos getting, uh, getting traffic that haven't gotten traffic in over a year. And now people, I guess, are going back and watching everything. I'm doing the same thing. I'm watching YouTube every night, watching a lot of videos. So stay on YouTube and watch these other motor vloggers and support their channels by subscribing. I'd appreciate it if you support mine too. So thanks again for joining me today. And I will see you next time on the next Cruise Man's Motor Vlog. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to click the subscribe button down below. And if you click the little bell icon, YouTube will notify you when we come out with new videos. Thanks again for joining us on Cruise Man's Garage.